I want to welcome Rick Russell to our Five Oaks Church with his sweet wife, Kathy, again. And um, I re we're looking forward to this message that you're going to bring to us. I know um, a while ago we spoke here, and, uh, and I remember the sermon was shaken out, and, and he was speaking about principles of stewardship. You know, when we give everything to God, he will supply us more than what we need. I want to thank uh, Elder Rick this morning because as treasurer of the Karana Conference, you may recall that it was just after COVID that we needed to replace the roof of our church due to storm damage. Um, that was an answer to prayer. And we got the bid and the company came and they worked with Adventist Risk Management and they replaced it and we had to pay a deductible that was $5,000. But because of people like Rick and the administration that we have in a conference who's very much involved with their churches and what's happened on the ground and concern about the well-being of you as members and us as pastors, we received a check from the conference said, we know that during COVID you went through a tough time, so we are going to pay half of your deductible. Which means instead of us paying $5,000, we only ended up paying $2,500. And we have a new church roof for $2,500. Who would like to say amen to that? Amen. God can always do more than what we ask. And Rick, I pray today that as you bring the word, that God will do more than what we ask through your ministry. Let us pray. Father, I uplift my brother Rick to you. I know he has a passion to see the work of Jesus finished. The gospel commission ended so that we can go home. I pray for your special blessing upon him as treasurer of our conference with the decisions that have to be made at conference level. Lord, we uplift you, our president, Leslie Louis, the administration, and Rick, and everyone at our conference. Thank you that we have a conference that's not removed from its members and its churches and its people but a conference who is involved with us on ground level. And today, as he breaks your word to us, I pray that you would uplift us through his message, use him through your Holy Spirit, and thank you for this experience that we have to be in your presence at this moment. Bless us, we pray, and bless him in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Will. What a blessing to be here today. This is the second time I've been on your campus this year. You may not have seen me, but in April, a team came to evaluate your school. And uh, I was on that team, and we spent the whole day here associating with your children and your teachers. And uh, at the end of the day, it passed with flying colors, your school. And saw here, we saw uh, Brother Stephen and Catherine at work in the classroom. Now, this is the place to be, right? I just saw them a week before last in Phoenix, where nearly 6,000 teachers across the North American Division were gathered for encouragement and instruction. And we, we sensed a wave of excitement about Adventist education there, because school enrollments if you could graph it across the North American division and in the Carolina Conference, the graph goes up and to the right. Attendance is bursting at the seams with many schools having a waiting list. Why, why do you think that is? Is there a time like no other right now when we should be preparing our kids for life here and in the hereafter? There are some things being taught in various places that I wouldn't want my children to learn. But here's a safe place. So I encourage you, as school starts, to be a supporter in whatever way you can to Adventist education. Thank you, Pastor Will, for your invitation this morning. Um, he mentioned earlier that we are October babies, born in the same year in a previous millennium. Mostly, I think, Will, that means we share the same aches and pains, right? We, we are 
but I have a history with your pastor that goes back over 20 years. Is that right? And it's a good history, a history full of friendship and encouragement, and you're blessed to have him here. I want to thank my wife for being with us. I want her to come up right now. as She's my better half, as you will see. And uh, I want to get her to give us just a, a very brief window on children's ministries. You heard the pastor saying that I've been going through a health challenge this year, but I'm going to tell you, God is faithful. He's been working ahead of me. And though I have been going through cancer, and I've had a remission and then a reoccurrence, God is working ahead of me, and I'm so thankful, and I feel great, and I'm going to continue to trust that he has a plan for me. And that's what we need to share with our kids. These banners say a message that means a lot to me. I know even more now that God loves me. And we need to tell our children and our youth and with each other, we need to share that message that God loves us. VBS is just finishing up with most churches, and it's an important evangelistic tool. And if you haven't had it, I didn't ask Pastor whether you've had it or not this year. You have, great. Such an important ministry to our children and to the people of our community. And I want to encourage you to keep that up. There are other opportunities, other things, resources that we can help you with at the conference. And I want to encourage you, if you have any needs, have any questions, please let me know. I'm here to help. I took a peek into the Sabbath school rooms uh, downstairs this morning and enjoyed so much what I was seeing. Thank you, teachers. Thank you, parents, for bringing your kids to Sabbath school. And thank you, teachers, for what you're doing for our kids. I just want to say it's an important message, not just that parents and teachers need to share, but every member of this congregation. We are all in a position where we can be a blessing to the children of our congregation. They are looking to us. And our care for them, our friendship for them, with them, our prayers for them mean something. So please keep our children in your prayers. Keep our parents, our youth, our families in your prayers. Prayer does make a difference. And I want to thank you for being a faithful congregation, for caring for your children. Please keep that up. Thank you. She's going to help me a little bit later in the sermon with some music to amplify the message. This morning, uh, I woke up here in Durham because we came over last night because it's from Charlotte, a two and a half hour drive. And so we stayed in the local Hampton Inn here down the, the street. And when we, we woke up, we realized this hotel offers a free breakfast. And as a good treasurer, I take advantage of free things. <laughs> and so there we were in the breakfast room. But dominating one wall was a huge 65-inch television with the headlines of the day being broadcast right out into our... We couldn't avoid it. I don't like to be reminded of many of the things that come across the news on Sabbath morning. But there it was. And... Uh, you know there was nothing new in the news, right? And if you watch it or read it, and it was certainly no different this morning, you know that division and discord and conflict are embedded in almost every headline. It's there. Um, it should be sure it's always been that way, right? Conflict. It's not news unless it stirs things up, right? But it seems to me, tell me if you, say an amen if you think this is true. It seems to me that we are reaching new levels of conflict and discord and division. Amen? The poles are wider apart than they have been in the past. Um, this is especially true in, in politics, in national politics. If you have been following it all, the divide is so great that there are no longer seems to be any room for negotiation or compromise. Dialogue and conversation suppressed. We can't even talk to one another now if we're on opposite sides. And that becomes even more true as more weight is given to the extreme positions on each side. We're polarized. 
This has impacted relationships, not only on Capitol Hill and in 50 state houses across our land, but also among the common people in all walks of life, right? If you're from a red persuasion, you may not be comfortable talking to someone from a blue persuasion. We can't even be seen together anymore, it seems. Has this impacted the church? That's a question we need to ask ourselves. Do we see division and discord in God's church? Are we beginning to reflect the larger society, even on issues of theology? In other words, theology is, what is God like, right? And sometimes we don't even agree on that. question is, can we preserve the church as a shelter in the storm of national and international global division? Is there an island that can be found of peace? And can it be God's church? My vision, my prayer this morning is that we can be that island. I want to illustrate by telling you about a family feud. A family feud. It's the story of two brothers in Europe, in the country of Germany. And let me tell you the story. You, you may recognize this. Adolf Dossler began making shoes in his mother's laundry room shortly after World War I. He was in the village, the small village in Germany of Herzogenrock, I had to work hard to learn how to pronounce that name, Herzog Generach. And he was making these shoes, and he started out in his mother's laundry room, and uh, his business picked up, it did well, and soon his older brother Rudolf, Rudy, joined him to help. Now, Adolf, or Adi, as he was known for short, he was the brains behind this thing. He was the innovator. He was the creative sort that had the ideas and had the vision to, to carry them out. But Rudy, Rudy was the salesman. He knew how to warm up relationships. He, he could sell anything to anyone. So they made a good team. Adi and Rudy, selling, making and selling shoes together. They named their, their company... Gebruder Dossler Sports Shoe Fabrik, meaning Dossler Brothers Sports Shoe Factory. And they called it GIDA for short, G-E-D-A, GIDA. Now, not too long into their establishment of their company, they, they innovated. They were the first ones. Adi had this vision to make a shoe for sprinters to be used on a track that had spikes in them. He was the first one to come up with that idea. So he, he innovated by making the first track spikes, and they saw a huge opportunity back in 1936 when the Olympic Games were taking place in Berlin. You may remember that year. Hitler was in power. The Olympics came to Berlin. And there was a young American by the name of Jesse Owens, a rising track star from America. And Adi Dossler uh, approached Jesse Owens and, and said, look, will you wear my shoes? Will you try my innovative shoes this year in the Olympics? Will you run in my Gita track shoes? Now, you may, you may remember that Jesse Owens, that year in the Olympics, won four gold medals for the United States, wearing Dossler Brothers' shoes. This was one of the first successful product placement advertising campaigns that ever took place. All of a sudden, the Dossler Brothers Shoe Factory, Gita for short, skyrocketed in sales. 
You may remember also that Hitler was in the stands as Jesse Owens was winning those gold medals, and he wasn't too happy because Jesse Owens was an African-American, and that didn't fit in with Hitler's idea of a master race. So that's another whole sermon in itself. Right. Yet, the triumph that the Dossler brothers experienced in the, in the Olympics was not quite the triumph it should have been because things were beginning to sour between the two brothers. They were having more and more disagreements. The brothers squabbled about many things. They couldn't agree on wages for their workers. They couldn't agree on what advertising campaign helped to use. They, they lived in the same townhouse, the two families, and the wives were fighting about who access to the kitchen. It was a difficult, difficult situation, and it was impacting the business. And the breaking ca point came during World War II in the 1940s, during an air raid, when Rudy was in the bomb shelter that was in the backyard of their house, tucked into the bomb shelter, and a few moments later, Adi and his family opened the hatch and came down in, and as, he, as his family entered, Rudy said, the dirty blankety blanks are back again meaning the Royal Air Force planes that were flying overhead. But Adi thought he was talking about his family as they entered the, the, the bomb shelter. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back. The feud was full on now. And from there, things quickly, quickly unraveled. After just a few more scuffles, the two split company in 1948 after the war. Adolf re retained the shoe factory, and two-thirds of the employees, while Rudy and his followers moved across the river to the other side of town, creating his own shoe factory. Now, the Orak River flowed through the town of Herzogenerat, right? and Adolf struck gold when he renamed his company he combined his first name, Adi, with his last name, Dossler, to make Adidas. He was located north of the river. Rudy tried to copy Adi by naming his company Ruda, but it never caught on. It just didn't ring with the, with the same sound. Later, though, he changed the name of his company to Puma to make it sound more athletic, right? He set up shop on the south side of the river, and the negotiations that the two brothers had while they were splitting up their business would be the last time that the Dossler brothers would ever speak to one another. Family feud. Now, it was said that you would have a hard time finding a household in that town, in that village, that didn't have at least one family working for either Adidas or Puma. That was the main industry in town. And if you worked for one company, you did not socialize with people who worked for the other company. It just wasn't done. Marrying across enemy lines was verboten. You couldn't do it. You only shopped in the stores on the same side of the river as the factory in which you were employed. The rivalry of Adidas and Puma was born. And it would divide the city for decades. Herzogenerak eventually was given a nickname. And it doesn't translate very well from the German, but it goes kind of like this. This was the nickname for that town. The town of Bent Necks. Sounds better in German. But why? Because every, everyone first looked down to see what kind of shoes you were wearing. <laughs> Could I be your friend or not? Rudy died 
1974, and he left Puma to his son. And Adolf died in 1978, four years later, and he left Adidas to his son. And the family feud crossed generations and continued. Rudy and Adi took their feud to the grave by being buried as far away as possible from each other in the same cemetery on opposite ends. So here we have the story of a family fight, a family feud. And this split, this tragic division, spilled beyond the family, split a whole town, and even split a whole industry. Implications were like ripples going out, waves going out from a, in a pond. Sadly, it's nothing new. It's not a new story, is it? It's older than the Garden of Eden, dating back to the split initiated by Lucifer in heaven and then again in the Garden of Eden. It's been passed down, that, that legacy of division has been passed down through the generations and even to the point that this book is full of family feuds, is it not? It's in there. Think about it. We've got Cain and Abel. We've got Ishmael and Isaac. Think about Jacob and Esau. Leah and Rachel. Joseph and his brothers. Miriam and Moses even tangled a bit, right? And there's more. Those are just the ones that come to my mind quickly. All of these fights, all of these feuds got in the way of what God was trying to do through his people in salvation history. You wonder, why in the world are they in the Bible? If I had been the editor of the biblical canon, it's a good thing I wasn't, I probably would have left some of these stories out, wouldn't you? because they're not very good PR. I'd have been tempted to try to make God's whole effort to save the world look a little more successful and tidy, right? Wouldn't you? But there they are. They're right there for the generations of the world to see. I think they're there for a reason. God's vision is that his family, the family of God that we sang about, otherwise known as the church, should live together in unity. And that sums up my message today. This topic of unity, this idea of togetherness and family, is so important that our church leaders saw fit to include it as one of the 28 fundamental beliefs that we have as a church. In fact, there's 28 of those beliefs, and unity in Christ is number 14, right in the middle. Right in the middle, which is an appeal to unity. Let me share with you a few sentences from that belief as it's listed in our, in our 28 fundamentals. It says, number one, the church is one body with many members called from every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people in Christ... We are a new creation. Distinctions of race, culture, learning, and nationality, and distinctions between high and low, and rich and poor, male and female, must not be divisive among us. What a wonderful diversity I see in your congregation. Looks like everybody's getting along. Looks like things are happening here. Praise God for that. We are all equal in Christ, right? That's what the, this, this says. Who by one spirit has bonded us into one fellowship with him and with one another. We are to serve and be served without partiality or reservation. And it goes on in that theme. And it lists many Bible texts at the bottom to support that fundamental belief of ours. Unity in the body of Christ. Now, one of those texts at the bottom 
of that belief is John, is John 17. The whole chapter is listed there. We read from it this morning. It's the magnificent prayer of Jesus. And if you have a Bible like mine, that whole chapter is in red, meaning it's the words of Jesus in prayer for us. The evening before he died, Jesus prayed this prayer. Jesus continued, even up to that late hour, agonizing over the condition of his disciples. He had just caught them that day arguing about who was to be first, who was to have the best seat in the kingdom. Jealousy had led to feuding. There's that word again. The disciples didn't seem to have a clue, right? Earlier, hadn't Jesus explained that he had not come to be exalted, not to be served, but to serve? That was his message to them. It went right over their heads. He also taught that the substance of his kingdom was humility and service. But all of this seemed to have fallen on deaf ears. So that night, he had to go to drastic measures to get his point across. He had them gathered in the upper room. And all of this tension was in the air, this feuding. So he made the point by not telling a parable, but by living one out. It played out that evening in, in, in the dramatic example of him washing the disciples' feet. They should have been washing feet, but Jesus did it instead. Even after that, it strikes me that they still didn't get it because we have no record of anyone washing Jesus' feet that night. He was the only one that walked out of that room with dirty feet. And he walked to his death with dirty feet. I don't want to be too hard on the disciples. You know. Let's make no mistake about it. You and I are those disciples who are failing to wash Jesus' feet. That living parable was just as much for us as it was for them. Sometimes we are the ones that fight with one another about doing those kinds of menial tasks. We feud to the death like the Dossler brothers. So what was Jesus to do but pray? Good place to go, right? Prayer. And pray is what he did. And John 17 contains my favorite prayer in the whole Bible. I'm kind of a connoisseur of prayers in the Bible. There's lots of them, and you could do a study on all the different, pr the prayer that Elijah prayed when he overcame the priests of Baal. The prayer that Mary prayed when she was given the task of being the mother of Jesus. There's so many great examples, but this is the pinnacle of prayer in John 17. And Jesus prayed. I love it because this prayer has a special way, like no other, of, of revealing the intimacy between Jesus and his father and the Holy Spirit. There is a sense of oneness that you pick up in Jesus' prayer. It's as though the curtain, as we read this prayer, it's as though the curtain was peeled back and we're eavesdropping on the Trinity. Study this prayer. It's important. So Jesus started out by praying for himself in John 17. And then he prays for his disciples. And then, incredibly, he prays for you and me. Can you imagine in your mind 
the concept that Jesus prayed for you and is still praying for you? If that doesn't, I didn't hear an amen. amen. That encourages me this morning. He started out by praying for himself, then he prays for his disciples, and then he prays for us. In verse 20, go there, John 17, verse 20, we read it earlier. He says, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Does that include you? Amen. Amen. It does. Jesus prayed for me. And as Jesus prays this prayer, it's my belief that the disciples were within earshot. And John was there, and he didn't even close his eyes because I think he had his quill pen out writing on papyrus everything that Jesus was praying so that we could read it today. Note that the thrust of his prayer, the main point, was for unity. Unity. And this is seen in several places, but you see it in verse 11. Father, keep through your name those you have given me that they may be one as you and I are one. We should have the same kind of oneness that is illustrated in the Trinity if we want to be the answer to Jesus' prayer. In verse 21, he repeats himself again. He says that they may all be one as you, the Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. It's almost as though he's including us in with the Trinity. I mean, not that we're worthy of that, but he says, let them be like us. That the world may believe that you sent me. So there's the stakes, right? How is the world ever going to believe if we don't demonstrate it to them? And again, he repeats it in verse 23. He says, I in them and you in me, that they may be one and that the world may know that you sent me. It's our responsibility because how else will the world know if we are not in unity with one another and with him? Jesus prays this prayer for us. And that in itself is incredible. It's hard for me to take in the fact that just when Jesus was at his very lowest, that night before he died, when he was betrayed by a friend and denied by another friend, knowing what he was about to go through at his very lowest, when he was about to be delivered to his death, he was praying for me. Wow. I don't know if I have that in me. When I'm suffering, it's pretty much all about me. But Jesus was other-centered. He was praying for me at his lowest moment. What incredible love. And it also reveals his great optimism. Given the shenanigans and failures of his disciples up to that point. How did Jesus maintain any hope at all that there would even be a second generation of believers and a third and fourth and fifth? But Jesus had faith. But somehow in his agony of spirit, he maintained his optimism that there would be someone to pass this on to even though his disciples were failing already. He chose to look at that low moment. He chose to look down the stream of time and focus on you and me and list us as a prayer request to the Father. And what's he praying? He's praying that we would be one. He's asking us to be united. And, well, let me, let me put it this way. This unity that he's talking about, it's not to be just a formal arrangement. 
uh, described by the church manual or something like that or encoded in the 28 fundamental beliefs. It's, it's, to be on, it's to leap off the page and be living a living thing. It's not just an outward thing. It's based on and must mirror nothing less than the unity between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Just as the Father is in the Son and the Son is in the Father, so we too are to live in that unity. It picks up on what Jesus said earlier in the book of John. In John 13, verse 35, he said, This is how all people will know that you are my disciples. This is how they're going to know. If you have love for each other. There's no other way that they'll learn this. Wow, I don't know how Jesus could have felt comfortable placing that much responsibility on us. But he did. What are we going to do about it? So John 17, it, it contains the supreme call to unity in the Bible. But it's not the only call, the only one, the only call to unity. It's a major theme in the whole Bible. You can find it in the Old Testament, all the way through Paul's letters, in the Gospels, in Jesus' prayer. You'll find it over and over again. I find it in Psalm 133, verse 1, where it says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in what? Unity. The psalmist told us that. We've been studying Ephesians, right, this, this quarter, we find it in Ephesians 4, verse 2 and 3. It says, With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Paul's counsel to us. Later in that same chapter, Ephesians 4, he says we need to do this because we are, and this is a unique phrase, we need to do this because we are members of one another. What does that mean? We are, we are not just members of a church with our names on the books. We are members of one another. That means you may be the hand, I may be the foot, the feet may want to go this way and the hands may want to do something over here, but we got to get it together, right? We are members of one another. And then you find it again in Galatians, in Paul's writings. Galatians 3, you all know this one. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you're all what? One in Christ Jesus. You could paraphrase that for today, right? Let me give you, take a shot at that. There is neither Muslim nor Mexican immigrant. There is neither sanitation worker nor executive vice president. There is neither Republican nor Democrat. And coming from Boston, there is neither Red Sox fan nor Yankee fan. There is neither vaccinated nor non-vaccinated. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. In his prayer for us, Jesus prayed it forward, right? You've heard of paying it forward. Jesus prayed it forward. He looked down the stream of time, and perhaps in that moment, he looked into 2022 and 2023 and saw a pandemic saw a war in Ukraine, he saw a fire in Hawaii. Who knows what, he, what Jesus saw as he formulated that prayer in John 17. But he looked ahead, we know that. And he saw the issues that divide our world today as he did that. And he prayed, prayed for us. He prayed his hopes and dreams for us and he was saying, Father, in his prayer, he said, it's a mess down here. 
So help my children in the church to keep from wearing those dividing issues on their sleeves. Let them be looking at you and me. Let them be like us. I want them to be one. Keep them from pushing their own agendas, whether they be political or racial or theological. Instead, get them involved in helping people. Let them wash each other's feet. Let them love like you and I love. Because, Father, no one will believe their message, right, if they don't. And that's why I'm praying to you tonight, Father. Jesus knew that our very credibility would be based on our unity. And that's why he prayed that, that we would be one. Kathy's going to sing about that unity right now. It's the song you know. together with cords that can 
So let's go back to the beginning. What about the Dossler brothers? What happened? What's the rest of the story? Well, as we heard, the brothers took their few to the grave by being buried on opposite ends of the same cemetery. Decades passed. After nearly 70 years, there was a reconciliation of sorts. In 2009, on United Nations World Peace Day, the two companies came together on the soccer pitch to make a symbolic peace with a friendly match. Now, it wasn't Puma against Adidas on the field. They took members of the Puma team and mixed them with the members of the Adidas team, and they played not against each other, but with each other. Kind of a nice thing. The teams were mixed on each side of the field as a sign of reconciliation. And both CEOs of the now public companies, stock traded companies, participated in the game. And while they may be friendly on the field, they are still very much remain rivals in the marketplace, right? But you have to wonder, you have to wonder what might have been if the feud had never happened. During those 70 years of feuding and alienation, both companies did quite well. I mean, you recognize their logos. But while the two were feuding and competing against one another, they hardly noticed another little shoe company, Nike, that was quietly gaining market share. And today, Nike is king of the sports shoe business with global sales that are nearly double those of Adidas and Puma combined. The feud cost them. They gave up a lot of ground to Nike because of their disunity. My appeal to you today in Durham Five Oaks, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, is not to give up any ground to the devil, but let's get united, let's be united, let's stay united, let's serve together, let's serve this community. And so here's my appeal, how is it with you? It starts with an individual, does it not? How is it with you? How is it in your family? In your relationships at work? How is it in your relationship with the people in the next pew? Is there anything you need to make right with your spouse, with your children, with your fellow church member, with your neighbors up and down the street? What is preventing unity in your life? Think about that. Ask yourself, during this moment of silence, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to just bow your heads with your eyes closed and your hearts open, and ask yourself this question. How can I become the answer to Jesus' prayer for unity? And is there anything I need to make right with someone? Just bow your heads for a moment of silence and think on these things. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your prayer for us. Thank, thank you for the unity of the, of the Holy Spirit, the Father, and the Son. And thank you for the example you've given us. Help us, Lord, to somehow be empowered to be the answer to your prayer for unity in this world. We give this prayer to you as you gave prayers to us. In your name I pray. Amen.